The journey of this awesome apex predator starts in my home state of Oklahoma, in the Antlers Formation of Atoka County, which is a layer of rock that ranges from Arkansas through southern Oklahoma and even a little bit into Texas. The holotype and paratype were found in the early 1940s, as with many dinosaur fossils at the time, they were found on farms, one belonging to Herman Arnold and the other to W.P. Cochran. It was described and named by John Stovall and Juan Langston Jr. in 1950. The hiatus between its discovery and description was largely due to World War II. Langston was serving in the Navy at the time and couldn't return until 1945. When they finished their studies though, they found that this dinosaur had some unusually large spines, and thus named it Aquacanthosaurus atacensis, meaning high-spined lizard from Atoka. We've found several other skeletons since then, ranging from all over the United States. This even includes a complete skull, and another very cool discovery that I'll get into towards the end, so stick around. The complete skull wasn't just important for giving us our first definitive look at the head of the animal, it also belongs to the largest specimen found so far. Aquacanthosaurus was a Carcharodontosaurid, the same family that contains the more popular Giganotosaurus. These are some of the largest terrestrial predators known, and Aquacanthosaurus was no exception. Estimations give us a length of 1.5 meters or 38 feet, and a height of almost 4 meters or 13 feet. It weighs in at 5 tons, comparable to a basking shark. The complete skull that we have is remarkably well preserved, and it seems to have an interesting shape compared to the others of its kind. The openings in the skull are pretty big, which would have made it lighter and easier to move around if needed. It had a small ridge in front of the eye as well, but it wasn't nearly as prominent as those in its relatives. The snout was a bit more rounded and seems to naturally dip down as well. Not only that, but based on a study of its ear canal and brain case, its head would have been habitually held at 25 degrees below horizontal, looking down ahead of itself. This is a characteristic that makes Aquacanthosaurus quite easy to identify by head alone, though where it really stands out is a bit further down. Tall spines are a big talking point in the prehistoric animal community. We have them in non-dinosaurs like Dimetrodon, herbivores like Dinochirus, and of course the infamous Spinosaurus. But figuring out what these spines were used for in each individual animal is not easy. For Aquacanthosaurus, they are pretty short and stout. It still would have helped with Gigantothermy by design, just by increasing surface area. It may have also stored fat to keep it going for extended periods of time. More on that later. Its arms aren't too special on first look, but a study on their articulation and range of motion in 2006 revealed some pretty interesting info from some very well-preserved fossils. Turns out they were super rigid so much that they couldn't even scratch its own neck, but they were extremely well adapted for pulling things towards its chest, and its fingers were both super flexible and permanently flexed in the first two digits. It's likely that Aquacanthosaurus hunted with its head first, while its claws were used to hold the struggling prey against itself, without worrying about dislocation, letting their talons dig in while the jaws did everything else. And with its range across the US and the variety of other fossils found in its ecosystem, Aquacanthosaurus had a lot of options when it comes to food. Given its position as the largest predator in its environment, it likely preyed upon the towering sauropods as well, like Sauroposidon. This leads us into the very cool discovery that I hinted at earlier. In Glenrose, Texas, several dinosaur footprints have been found since the beginning of the 1900s consisting of those from theropods and sauropods. Based on its geographical and geological location, it's a pretty safe bet to say that they were made from Aquacanthosaurus, with the sauropod footprints potentially belonging to a young sauroposidon. It's not confirmed that they were made immediately within the same time frame, but it certainly gives the impression that the predators were tracking their prey over a very long distance, which makes a good case for their hump being used as a fat energy storage device. Either that, or they already injured them, and were simply waiting for them to bleed out, which does not seem like a fun way to go. And if the tracks were made by multiple individuals, it's likely that there was a group of Aquacanthosaurus traveling together as a unit, 
which is pretty awesome. As for other potential prey items for Aquacanthosaurus, each location it was found in offers various options. In the Antlers formation, there was Astrodon, a small sauropod, Tenontosaurus, a long-tailed dinosaur similar to Iguanodon, and even Deinonychus. The Dromaeosaur, for which the Jurassic Park raptors were based on, could have been food for Aquacanthosaurus. Other areas where it was found include Montana and Maryland, where there were Ankylosaurs, like Sauropelta, Ceratopsians, like the beaked Aquilops, and small mammals, one of them being Gobi Conodon. Thanks to its iconic hump and the importance of its footprints, Aquacanthosaurus has gotten quite a few media spotlights. It had a pretty big role in the Dinosaur King anime, where it has a really tragic backstory of losing his mate and child and then having to confront their fossilized remains in the present day. Later on, it became even more powerful and got searing hot skin in the process. It was also shown in the docuseries Monsters Resurrected, where the Glen Rose footprints were first portrayed with CGI. Not much later, it was given a short moment in Dinotasia, where it had a much more accurate model and still holds up well today. It even appeared in the Land Before Time series as a kind of sharp tooth. With video games, it's seen in several installments in the Jurassic Park franchise, including the most recent Jurassic World Evolution 2. It's also in the Nintendo DS game Fossil Fighters, along with Ark Survival Evolved and the majority of Dinosaur Simulation games. That concludes this month's Prehistoric Animal. As per usual, make some fossilized footprints over to twitch.tv slash paleoentertainment to hang out live. Join the Discord linked below to talk with nerds like you, and consider joining my Patreon, which I've just opened up to kickstart the new year. Get exclusive rewards like deciding what videos I make, or get downloadable dinosaur animations, and help me make bigger and better content for y'all. Love you guys, and as always, keep your pencils sharp.